In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, for those of you who have been longtime fans of this program and have been following me for a while, you may remember that we actually started on a series in the book of Daniel, and because I had to leave the show and, and take a leave of absence for almost a whole month, in fact, it may have been a month, because of that, we never finished the series that we started on the book of Daniel. And so I thought it would be good to go ahead and start that back up, and, and we may take a couple of breaks if I think that there's a Bible verse that's ex especially pertinent for the story that we're covering, but I wanted to go back to Daniel, and just to give a quick recap, because it's been a while since we covered this topic. Where we were in the book of Daniel is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends, and Daniel's not in this story, we're not really sure why, it's just the way that it is. They have been put in a position of power and influence. They have been put in a position where they have some level of authority and some level of say with the king. And because of this, there are certain people that do not like them, that have it out for them, and the king has this vision, and he decides to create an idol. And he commands that whenever the idol is brought up and the music starts playing, everybody has to bow down and worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are Jews. They worship one god, they don't believe in idols, and because of that, they say no. And then the people that have it out for them, that really are envious of them and want their job, they go tattle on them with the king and say, hey, these guys, they didn't worship or bow down or anything when the music started. And the king, I'm sure in his mind, was being very generous and, and very forgiving and saying, okay, I'll give you another chance. Just the next time that it happens, then you need to worship the idol. And, and they say, no, we're not going to do that. We, you know, we, we're not trying to cause a problem, but we don't worship your gods. We worship our God and nobody else. And so this whole thing takes place, and as punishment for refusing to worship an idol, they're, of course, cast into the fiery furnace. And this furnace is incredibly hot. It's seven times hotter than it normally was, and it was so hot, and the flames were so intense, it consumed the people that threw them into the furnace. And yet, when the king and his men look inside the furnace, still blazing, there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and somebody else could be an angel, could be Christ. We don't really know. The Bible is not very descriptive on that. But regardless, somebody was in there protecting them. Someone who was from God was there making sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were fine. And so we're going to go ahead and read sort of the fallout and the response to this in Daniel 3, 26 and 27. And it reads, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace blazing f of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the perfects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair on their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. The reason I think this is so important is because Nebuchadnezzar now understands who's really in charge. He didn't understand it before. After seeing this miracle, he definitely understands now. Now, does that mean that he understands everything, that God is the only God? It doesn't seem to be. In fact, he refers to him as the Most High God, which could mean that he believes that their God is the only God, but considering we see very different behavior from him later in this same book, probably not. He's probably still a pagan. He probably still thinks that there are lots of gods, and, and their God is one of many. But now he knows that even if he believes in other gods, that their God is the Most High God, and he sees a very visual display 
of God's power, and that really does change the way he sees the world. And you may recall, if you go back a little bit earlier in this same book, right before he throws them into the furnace, when he's sort of having this conversation with them about why they refuse to worship, he says specifically, what God is there that can deliver you? And this gives us a lot of insight into Nebuchadnezzar and his worldview. See, this is not a man who's an atheist. He's a pagan. He believes in lots of gods. And yet even he is looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and saying to them, are you really suggesting that there even is a God that exists that is powerful enough to keep me from punishing you? See, he's not just suggesting that a God of some kind won't do it. He's saying there is not a God in existence that is more powerful than me. That's what he's saying, because he's saying there aren't other gods that have the ability to deliver you from my wrath. Nebuchadnezzar has essentially made himself more powerful than any god that he believes in. And notice how in this episode, they don't merely survive. They are completely untouched. The way that the Bible describes it, and it's very descriptive and it's very specific. The hair on their head wasn't singed. Their clothes weren't harmed. So not only did God grant them some kind of temporary immunity to the fire and that their clothes burned off, but they were fine. No, no, their clothes were fine. They didn't even smell like fire when they came out. So to put this in terms of a big victory, this wasn't just God sort of saving them with the power that he had and using everything he's got. This is something that is a trifle for God, barely a passing thought. To put it into sports terms, since we're all talking about the NCAA tournament right now, this isn't like God wins by 20 points. This is like God wins 500 to zero, the other team doesn't even score a goal. And so this shows God's power not only in a way that he has the ability to deliver them, but he has the ability to do far greater than that. And so this is a feat that really puts God's power on display. They're not merely survived, they actually are completely untouched and unaffected by the fire. So it's not only that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have power over their life or their death, it really kind of shows that he doesn't have power over them at all. When he's talking about servants of God, he can't just harm them, he can't even burn their clothes. That's how powerless Nebuchadnezzar is in comparison to God. And I think that the lesson that it really brings to us is that God can bring us through fires in the same way. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he allows us to feel the effects of the flame. Sometimes he allows us to go through very difficult situations in our life. And I'm sure in the life of these three men, it wasn't much different. I'm sure that in the lives of these three men, they went through several things that were very difficult for them. God didn't deliver them untouched through everything, but the point is that he can. And there are times when he does, probably times when we don't even realize it ourselves, that God brings us through an ordeal that really should have broken us, and we come out completely untouched, unaffected, not even smelling like fire. And so because of that, I think that it is a testament to God's power in the way that he works in our lives. And what was the effect of that? The effect of that is you had a man that was a pagan that didn't believe that there was even the possibility of a God that existed powerful enough to stop him from doing what he wanted, to realizing, oh, I don't have any power compared to this God. Compared to the power that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have, I'm nothing. And once he realized that, it changed his attitude and it changed the way he saw them and changed the way he saw himself. And that's exactly what God does with the fires of our lives. When there's something very difficult that we have to go through, we may not even realize it, but God brings us out either completely unfazed or untouched, and we don't even realize why that happened. Maybe it was because God was trying to show somebody else, somebody that we weren't expecting, his power. And he's saying, because this is my servant, I did this great thing for them. And that acts as a testimony to other people. And even though I certainly didn't escape unscathed, this is kind of the way that I feel with what happened through my cancer treatment. 
I mean, the doctors and the people around me were astounded at how quickly I recovered and how fast the chemo worked. And frankly, so was I. I didn't expect it to be that quick. It was far easier than I ever thought it was going to be. And I think a lot of that was because there were other people around that saw that and, and maybe that affected their lives too. I don't know that for sure. Maybe I'll never know, or at least not until I get to, to ask God about it personally. But the point is, sometimes God brings us through those fires so that he can affect the life of another person to teach us a lesson, but also to teach those around us about his power and his great love for those who live according to his will. And these fires can be in the form of sickness, in the form of losing somebody, or just going through something really difficult personally in your life. But the point is, God has the power to deliver you from the fire, just like he delivered them. Because all throughout the biblical narrative, God really only uses his power for two reasons. To protect people, to care for them in some way, whether it's through, like in here, physical danger, sickness, spiritual woes, whatever. He uses his power to do that. And he also uses his power as a teaching mechanism. And he almost always uses it at the same time for both of these situations. He almost always uses it for both of those purposes. And we see that over and over again in the biblical narrative. So when you're going through something, whether you come through completely unfazed or whether you have to take some licks, but God still delivers you through that situation, remember that it's for your benefit, but it's also for the benefit of those around you in a way that you may never understand how impactful that was to another person's soul and their relationship to God. Because God can bring us through the fires for our sake and for the sake of those that are watching. Stay the course, friends. Hey, y'all know I'm a stats and numbers guy, so here's some fun facts for you. People that subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel are 200% more satisfied with their online video content and 400% more likely to be able to speak intelligently about politics and religion with somebody they know. Also, Four out of five people that subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel live healthier, more fulfilling lives. And that fifth guy was just a social justice warrior with a stick up his butt. Also, 82% of the statistics on the internet, totally made up.